We're talking about The Circle Maker. It's based on the book by Mark Batterson, so you can Amazon that. Mark Batterson wrote this powerful book about really praying boldly. And one of the lines in the book that I shared with you last week was this idea that God honors bold prayers because God is honored by bold prayers. God honors bold prayers because God is honored by bold prayers. And so this entire month of July, we're just talking about what does it look like to really have a bold prayer life? And what would that look like for you in your practical everyday life? And then in August, we're going to kick off August, get ready for the school year, get ready for the fall with 21 days of prayer. It's something we do around here and it's absolutely powerful. Every time we do 21 days of prayer, we did 30 days of prayer at the beginning of the year, but 21 days of prayer, when we all get together as a church and begin praying together, is powerful. And so I want you to be a part of that. And I also want to set you up for victory. So this entire month of July, I've been using the Circle Maker as kind of the, the base camp for all of us to continue to return to and talk about what does it mean to pray bold prayers. Let me remind you about the Circle Maker and where this idea came from. It came from an old Jewish text, not actually the scriptures or the Bible, but this, this story about an old rabbi in the first century Jerusalem named Hani. I like that name, Hani. And Hani, in the midst of a drought, in the midst of a drought, no rain, and people are scared, people are nervous, people are asking Hani to pray. He's known for his prayer life. He's known for the bold prayers that he prays. Hani does something unthinkable, unimaginable. He goes out to the edge of town, Jerusalem there, and he takes his staff and he begins drawing a circle in the sand. And he says, God, I'm not leaving this circle. He prays, God, I'm not leaving this circle until you make it rain. And not like a little rain. I want you to fill up cisterns and I want you to fill up caverns. I want you to make it rain by your gracious, by your power. I'm not leaving the circle until you make it rain. And last week we talked about praying bold prayers, that God is honored by that. That God is honored when we ask him to do things that only God could do. That there is a point in every single one of our life where we end and God picks up. We have to get to that place in our spiritual journey. If not, then God is somehow some kind of glorified bellboy that we just kind of ring the bell and he comes and helps us and supports and assists and gives us a good job, right? And then it becomes religion, which is even more evil, right? When it, when it steps away from a relationship with God, it becomes religion where there's do's and don'ts and we measure our spirituality by our do's and our don'ts and then we just get really good at judging other people by their do's and don'ts. And Hani brings us back to this idea that it is a relationship with you and God and that God wants to be so active in your life in every area, in every area. I was reflecting a lot on the past eight years that Waterline has been in existence, that Daniel and I have been leading this and working on this together. But eight years ago, I was scared to death to start Waterline, to initiate to start something that God had laid on our hearts, I was scared to death. In fact, for years, I wanted to plant a church, but I was too scared to. I don't know if you've ever had anything in your life that would just seem like the biggest obstacle or the biggest difficulty or the thing that you knew you should do and you didn't want, you, you were just afraid to do it, right? That's the feeling I had. In fact, when I was 12, my dad started a church in a bar in Dayton, Ohio. That's, that's how I grew up going to church. Some of you went to churches that had pews and stuff. No, no, I went to church that had a, Pap's blue ribbon sign, okay, in the window, all right? That's, that's how we were. And so um, I, I grew up going to church like that, and I just loved being a part of churches that were reaching lost people, people who were far from God, just introducing them to who Jesus was. And so when I, when I uh, became a pastor, I knew that God would put on Danielle and I's heart to plant a church. I just kind of knew that. In fact, in 2006, we moved here to Fisher's. And we were being uh, brought on to an awesome church. And we told them, look, we want to plant a church. We believe that that's what God's called us to do, to start a church for people who don't go to church, for people who are far from God. We want to show them what it looks like to love God and love others. And they said, awesome, you come here and help us and we'll help you launch out on that. And you know what happened? I got so comfortable in that church, full of great people, great opportunities. I mean, we just absolutely love the people at that church, and I just became more and more fearful and less and less faithful in the calling, in the calling that God had on our lives. I began reading this book called In a Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day. On a Snowy Day. 
It's a really horrible name for a book, and it's by Mark Batterson as well. Mark Batterson has a way of writing books that mess up my life, okay? So I wouldn't recommend reading him, all right, uh, unless you're ready to do something new with your life. But he wrote in this book on page 24, and uh, I just wanted to show you what it said. It said, too often our prayers revolve around asking God to reduce the odds in our lives. We want everything in our favor, but maybe God wants to stack the odds against us so we can experience a miracle of divine proportions. Maybe faith is trusting God no matter how impossible the odds are. Maybe our impossible situation are opportunities to experience a new dimension of God's glory. The odds were definitely against Danielle and I in starting a church. Eight, ten years ago when we were praying about and thinking about planting Waterline Church, only 90%, the studies showed that only 90% of church plants made it. Only 90%. So th that statistic has changed, by the way. It's incredible the things that we've been able to learn and the things that we've been able to apply to see that statistic drop. But at the time, I was scared to death. There's tons of risk, right? There's tons of risk. One is financial, that Danielle and I would have to resign our jobs, that we would have to step out in faith and believe that God was going to provide financially for this project to come to life, that this thing that he was going to call us to, he was going to provide for it. And we heard all, I mean, we heard that where God gives a vision, he's going to give a provision. We believe that. But I didn't have the faith to go on that. I really didn't. I was so full of fear. There's our reputation. Danielle and I worked in student ministries. We worked with youth, and we loved it. We, were, we felt like we were good at it. We had started after school program. We, we, we just knew how to speak with youth. We knew how to speak. I knew exactly how to talk to someone very immature. <laughs> I was really good at it. And as, as we led in that, you know, we just thought, man, if we step away from where we're good at and we step into something, we don't know if we're going to be good at this. We could, we could fail at this. Our reputation could be on the line for this. We could risk it all. And, and wh what then? What if we never got a job again? What if we never worked for a church again? And all these fears that kind of continue to grow. One time I went and I used to hang out with church planners. That's how I knew God had this calling on my life, but I was just too afraid. I was hanging out with this group of church planners from all over Indianapolis. They were coming together at the Starbucks. And I was hanging out with them one day. And they said, John, you've got these ideas. And obviously you and Danielle are called to do this. Why aren't you doing this? And I, I listed off all the risks, all the things that, that just scared me about stepping out on faith and trusting God to provide. And they said, if you're waiting, one of the pastors said, if you're waiting for God to remove the fear factor, he'll never do that. It's because in those situations, when the odds are stacked against you, that's where God loves to show up. God, listen to me, church. God loves your impossible situations. But when we start to pray circles around the impossible situations in our life, it takes risk, and it always will. I read, I read your prayers this week, and I'm reading some of them going, oh, man, Lord, you got to show up. This is, like, if you don't show up in this, where is our faith going to be? God, you got to show up in all of these places. These are big things that you have identified, that you have written down. And, and I put circles on your chairs this morning, and I would love it. You just write down that prayer. Share it with me. I want to pray with you. I want to pray circles around your life this week. As you, as you are praying those circles, I want to pray those with you. It wasn't until uh, the end of September when my son Dean was born. In fact, this week, I found the old video camera, and... Um, uh, I found old videos of Dean growing up, and here, here's what I knew. When I got married, man, I was so excited because I had tricked, I mean, asked Danielle to marry me, and uh, she said yes, and we got married, and, and it was just like awesome. It was so great, and then when Dean was born, I was really excited as well, and, and if you're a dad and you know this experience, like you're sitting there in the... Uh, hospital room, and you're thinking to yourself, as, as I was, like, you're hold, I'm holding Dean right there in my hands, and I'm thinking, I could totally screw up his life. Like, that's what I was thinking. Like, I'm not prepared for this. I'd never changed a diaper before, okay? This was like a first-time thing here. Like, this, I was nervous. Am I prepared for this? Am I ready for this? And this was my, I literally, right there in the hospital room, 
I believe God used Dean right away to start leading my life. Dean, actually, the, the name Dean means spiritual leader. And we named Dean, and I believe Dean's going to be a spiritual leader, but he's already been a spiritual leader in my life. In fact, if you've come to this church long enough, you know that pretty much I'm learning over the shoulder of Dean of who God is. But as I held Dean in that hospital room, I, I realized that if I didn't chase the thing that God had called me to do, that Dean was going to grow up, and I would tell him all about my faith, but he wouldn't see it. He would just see the fear. And if I really wanted Dean, my son, to see faith and see what it meant to really trust God with your life, I had to do this. I had to do this now so that as he grew up, even if I failed, even if things didn't work out, he would say, I knew that my dad was faithful. I knew that my dad was obedient. I knew that my dad was trusting God. And so soon after the birth of Dean, we went in and Danielle and I, we resigned our jobs and we said, we're going for this. We're going after what God has called us to do, to start Waterway. I'm so glad that we did that. I am so glad that we did that because I look now at the churches that we're starting, the churches that we've been a part of to start, and the people, all the people who have come to know Jesus Christ and the disciples who are making disciples, who are making disciples and people who we have discipled and, and raised up in leadership and, and to see how all of you are catching that same vision and catching what God wants to do and saying, I want to be a part of that. I want to give my life to that. And we've been just been praying circles and circles and circles around and seeing God do miracles. It's been an incredible journey. I'm honored. I'm blessed, seriously, to be your pastor. I love being the pastor of this church. It's an awesome honor. I love it. And I love you. I love this church. I love showing up here, even in the midst of July, right? And in July, you know what I mean? There's a lot of places you could be. Maybe some of you have been traveling, and you finally made it back here. I'm telling you, I'm glad you're here. We love having you here this morning. I want to teach you, though, this concept right here. The size of your prayers is the size of your God. Would you write that down? I, I gave you a little follow along guide in your next steps folder and I just want you to write that down today because it's something I want you to walk out of here with. The size of your prayers is the size of your God. Now, I don't know what your prayer life is like. I don't know what you've asked God to do in your life recently. If it's been to bless your food or get you to the gas station when you're on empty I don't know what your prayer life has been like. I don't know if you've been able to draw a circle around an impossible situation in your life where you know this has to be a God thing. Only God could pull this off. I don't know where that is. I don't know what your bold prayer is. But the size of your prayer is the size of your God. That's definitely something I've been learning over the last eight years of planting waterline. The size of your prayer is the size of your God. You got it? Now go with me to Matthew chapter 14. I want to show you this scripture. It's an amazing story. I absolutely love this story. One of my favorites. Because it's a place in scripture where Jesus is discipling his disciples. He's got 12 disciples that have been following him around all over the place. Chapters 1 through 7 of Matthew is really the teachings of Jesus Christ. One of his most famous sermons, the Sermon on the Mount, is being spoke about. And then in chapter 8, he starts on his ministry. And he starts doing these incredible miracles all over the place, all the way up to chapter 14, where he does another miracle. And he does this miracle, but he uses the disciples in it. No longer are they bystanders. No longer are they on the bench, but Jesus invites them into an impossible situation that where they end and he picks up. Let's pick up here. As soon as Jesus heard the news, he left in a boat to the remote area to be alone. But the crowds heard where he was headed and followed on foot from many towns. And so Jesus has been doing ministry. He's been teaching, but he's been doing these miracles, crazy miracles, amazing miracles. And Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. That evening, the disciples came to him, to Jesus, and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, that isn't necessary. You feed them. But we have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. I love this story because it's this incredible moment where, where Jesus has been doing all these incredible miracles and now he lands and they show up, and he's, they said, you know, the obstacles and the difficulties here are so great. Just send the people away. And Jesus says, that's not necessary. 
right? You give them something to eat. Now, we find out at the end of the story, we're going to read that there's 5,000 men, including women and children. Now, I can just imagine that there's men, and when you have a man loves a woman, they make children. That's just how scientifically it works. And so if a man loves a woman and they create one kid, sometimes they can create two kids. So if you think about that, there's 5,000 men there gathered around, and there's that many women, and then that many children. There's possibly 20,000 people gathered to see Jesus to hear from Jesus, to be around Jesus. And Jesus is just moving through the crowd, healing people and talking to people and having compassion to them and teaching the crowd. There's this incredible moment pictured in your head. Imagine with me. This is probably the largest crowd, by the way, the disciples had ever seen in their entire life. 20,000 people are around Jesus. There's no posters, there's no Facebook posts, there's no Twitter going on. These are people who have heard something or seen something. They have dropped what they are doing. They have traveled from all kinds of distances just to be in the presence of Jesus, to be there. And the disciples are so overwhelmed that these people are getting hungry. It's getting late. Where are we going to sleep? Who's watching these kids, right? If you've got kids like mine, what are we going to do? And Jesus says, it's not necessary to send them away. We could do something right here on this hillside to feed 20,000 people. What a miracle. And the response of the disciples, I think, is surprising to me. Honestly, I don't mean to criticize. But they, they say to Jesus, Send them away, and they, and, but we only have, they said, we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. That's all we got. That's it. We don't have anything else to work with. We don't have a catering company. There are no food trucks. What do we, they only have, would you just say this, we only have, would you just say that, we only have. Everybody in our life has an area of life where we say, we only have this much. Where we come to an end and God picks up. Let me just remind you for a second, though, of the miracles that Jesus had done. In chapter 8, he healed a paralyzed man who was dying in his bed in a whole nother city, and Jesus just said the words, and a guy in another city was healed instantly. Also in chapter 8, a man suffering with leprosy, an untouchable person, considered unforgivable, Jesus embraces him, and as he embraces him, he's healed, completely healed. In Capernaum, he healed every sick person in town, Matthew says, and he cast out demons using only his words. Just by saying it, demons were being cast out, and everybody in the town, every sick person was healed. You remember that if you lived in Capernaum, the day Jesus showed up and every single person was healed. Jesus spoke and controlled weather patterns, causing a storm to stop in its tracks. And while walking with a crowd of people, a woman touched Jesus' clothing, and she was healed from 12 years of internal bleeding. This is just in chapter 8. In chapter 9, a man who could no longer talk and was demon-possessed, the demon was cast out, and he was healed. And the whole town, hundreds of people, saw it happen and began telling other people what had happened there. Two men, blind were healed and could see. And the news of their miracle spread, it says, throughout the entire country of how God healed these two blind men. Chapter 9, again, a little girl was dead and her father was so desperate, he asked Jesus to come to his house and brought him back to his house to heal his dead daughter. And when Jesus came, people called the man crazy and stupid for bothering Jesus and for thinking Jesus could do anything about this. Just imagine the desperation of this man that you, your little girl has died. And I don't know the pain and the agony he was feeling, but he's looking for answers. And he finds Jesus, he says, brings him to his house and says, can you, what can you do here? When Jesus came, the people called the man crazy and stupid, but Jesus took his dead daughter's lifeless hand and held it. And immediately she came to life and sat up. These 12 disciples are watching this. They're seeing this. They're hearing this. And news about this is spreading everywhere. People are telling people. The entire countryside is talking about this Jewish rabbi named Jesus, that when he steps in, things happen. Lives change. Sick are healed. Demon possessed. The demons are cast out. Chapter 12, a young man who was born with a withered hand. Jesus said, stretch it out. And as he did, 
it was made perfectly healed. And the religious leaders were so convinced he actually healed the guy, they started to plan how they should kill Jesus. So when we get to chapter 14, and there's 20,000 people showed up, why do you think they're there? Because Jesus has been doing miracles after miracles after miracles and after miracles. And somehow, these 12 disciples who were there in the very beginning, who've been following Jesus, who've had a front row seat to all these miracles, somehow they see a crowd of 20,000 people and they say, we can't do this. This is way too big for us. Send them away. And Jesus said, watch this, it's not necessary, you feed them. For the first time in Matthew, rather than Jesus being the source of all the miracles, all of a sudden he says, you do one. Think about it. All these crazy miracles. Now you try it. We only have, the disciples say. The problem with the disciples, and maybe the problem with you and I, is that we are stuck in 2D thinking, 2D perspective, 2D view of life. We're blind. See, we can only see the here and the now. That's all we get. Yeah, we can remember and think back to the past, but we can't put all the details in place. And we can't see all the details that went into that. We can think about the results of the past, but we can't relive the past. We can't go back to the past. We live in the here and now. And so all of our problems seem really, really big because all we can see is the here and now. We are stuck with 2D view of life. We look at the problem from within the problem, but God doesn't look at it that way. God looks at it from the outside looking in. And he's got 4D thinking. You think HD is great? Try 4D. 4D says, I can see the past and all the things that went into it to get us to this point right here. I can see where God was. I can see all that is happening here. And I can see the future. I can see how every single decision and every single thing will make it go. And I can see all the results already happening. I can see where you're at. I can see the breadth of it. I can see how much you need. I can see how little you need. I can see what will happen. That's God's view for your life. And so oftentimes we invite God into our big problems, but our problems seem really big because our God seems really small. Every time your problem seems really big, it's because your God seems really small. Yes or no? Yes or no? Is God enough? Will he be enough for you? Is he big enough for your biggest problem? Is he greater? Can he actually do it? The disciples are confronted with this. Jesus puts it right in their laps. And he said, that's not necessary. You do it. And they have to answer the question that confronts every single one of us every time we bow our heads to pray and every time we circle, yes or no, is God bigger? Yes or no, is he going to be enough? Yes or no, Is he greater than your greatest problem? Yes or no? This is a teaching moment for these disciples. And so Jesus says, give me what you have. I love that. Let's keep reading. Bring them here, he said. And then he told the people to sit down on the grass. And Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish and he looked up toward heaven and he blessed them. And then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples who distributed it to to the people, like all the people. Listen. Listen. Your little bit in life, when put in the hands of God, when entrusted to God, will always multiply. It will always multiply. Danielle and I had this vision to plant churches. To say, what would it look like to raise up disciples who disciple, who disciple, who disciple? What would that mean for our community, for our county, for the surrounding counties. And in September, God spoke a clear vision to Danielle to plant churches in the 34 high schools in the five counties around Waterline. 
what would that mean? What would that take? That just seemed, because I'm a planner. I strategize. I put it all together. I want a business plan. I want a schedule. I want an action plan, right? Like, that's what I want. I want to see it on paper. Then I go, yeah, we can do that. That makes sense. And no joke, I sat down to my desk and said, okay, let's put the plan together. Very clear vision. We knew what we were going to do. Let's put a plan together. And I started getting into it. And I said, God, we can't do this. This is way too big for Waterline. This is way too big for our capacity. We don't have the resources for this. We don't have the manpower for this. We don't have the, ta- I don't have, I'm not talented enough. To, I don't even know what I don't even know, God. There's so much here. And honestly, I was stuck in my 2D thinking. And I just began praying, God, would you make a way? Would you make it possible? We began to draw a circle around these five counties and God, we want to plant a church here and we're not leaving here until it's done. We are not stopping until it's done. In that very moment, no joke, I'm sitting at my desk putting the action plan together. No joke, uh, our district superintendent calls us and he says, hey John, can I talk to you about what's happening in Pendleton? We have a building there, we have a location there, but we have no church there. We have no pastor there. If we gave Waterline that building and those facilities, could you do something with it? I'm like, it just so happens that God has called us to go to Pendleton. It just so happens that he's put the vision on our hearts to do this. And I said, yes. I don't know how. I said, yes, we can do something with it. We'll do something with it. I'm, I'm still sitting at that same spot, the same day, the same moment, and I'm praying. And I get an email in my inbox, and I'm, I have ADD, so I'm distracted very easily. I said, oh, what's this email say from my friend? I click on it. And this friend says, John, we've, we've come into some resources and some finances and we want to tithe on it. We weren't expecting this, but we would like to give $55,000 to Waterline for what God has laid on your heart and the vision that God has for you. Out of the blue. I could not have planned that. I could have not put that on the calendar. I could not, but God saw the circle we were drawing and said, I'll honor that. I'll honor that. I'll bless that. I don't know how it's going to happen, but God has already put a seed in the ground. God has already started something in this church. He's, and I believe he wants to do the exact same thing in your life. When we take our little bit and put it in the hands of God, it will multiply. It will multiply. And so we pray bold, risky prayers and say, God, show up right here. Well, watch what happens with the disciples. Jesus prays over it, and they all ate as much as they wanted. 20,000 people ate all that they wanted. This isn't the last wedding reception you went to or anything like that, right? That catered meal, that box lunch, that there's never enough in the box. You just keep looking, and there's never enough, right? This was where everyone ate all they wanted. Listen, God knew. Jesus knew. The miracle is, the miracle is 20,000 people, 20,000 people are on a hillside right now in Israel. That's a miracle in itself. That's an incredible miracle because of Jesus. The the miracle is that they're able to hear him and he's healing people and he's healing sick people, all these. If the miracle ended right there, it would have been a great day. But Jesus brings his disciples in and he can measure out how much food is needed in each single person's belly. That's pretty incredible right there. That's pretty amazing. Not only that, but there's leftovers leftovers and I think that was a miracle just for the disciples see God knows you personally he knows you intimately and he knows how to get your attention and when we circle things and say God I'm not moving from this circle till you do this God loves to show up in our bold prayers he loves to honor bold prayers I love this part right here the disciples picked up 12 disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers and about 5,000 were fed that day in addition to all the women and all the children. Think about this for a minute. This was a circle maker moment right here. This was a circle maker teaching moment right here for Jesus. He said, now, now not only did we feed all 20,000 people, I want you disciples to go pick up the leftovers. See, everybody else is sitting back and they're telling stories and they're, you know, they're full from dinner and all that, but it's the disciples who are still waiting the tables. They're picking up the leftovers and they say, wow, look what God did. Look what God did. And they're looking at each other from around the 20,000 people that they're moving around. And they're looking at each other like, are you seeing this? And they all show up. And every time they put food in the basket, it was a reminder to pray circles. It was a reminder to pray circles. 
that God is bigger than your biggest problem. And the size of your prayers is the size of your God. If you want to have a big God, pray big prayers. And watch him show up. Risk it. Risk everything. It's one thing I want to pass along to my kids. I want to put ourselves in places where where we have to risk everything and say, kids, if God doesn't show up, then it's not going to happen. I always want to lead this church to places where if God doesn't show up, this can't happen. That we live on the edge of that. And we pray bold prayers, Waterline. There was another point in those disciples' lives where Jesus, he came to them at a meal, communion. And it was just regular bread and regular wine like they had lived with their entire lives. I'm going to invite our volunteers to go to our communion table. I want to invite you into communion right now. A moment where Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which will be broken for you. And every time you eat it, remember, never forget, remember how much I love you and how I am bigger than your brokenness. I am bigger than your brokenness. <laughs> and he took the wine. And he said, every time you drink this, remember Remember that my love is greater than your sin. Remember, it washes you clean, fresh start, new beginning, restart right here every single time. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I show up at church and I think to myself, all I've got is bread and juice. That's all I got. I can't fix the brokenness in my life and I can't heal my own sin. And I love it that Jesus does a miracle in this. He does a miracle in this and he invites you and I to come here every time and say, you think it's just bread and juice, but in my hands, it's way bigger than that. Way bigger than that. And I want to invite you, Waterline. We're going to have four stations, two in the back, one right here, one right here. We practice open communion at Waterline, meaning everybody can participate. We just ask that you would confess your sins to Jesus Christ. Accept him as Lord and Savior of your life. And when you take this meal, you take in Christ. You make him Lord of your life. You make him bigger than your biggest problem. You make his love greater than your greatest sin. And it's a restart. It's a brand new beginning. It's to go from 2D seeing to 4D seeing. It's to say, God, change my view of life change my view of life. Help me pray bold prayers. Here's how we're going to do this this morning. You're going to exit out your rows. You can either go to the front or to the back. There is gluten-free in the back. And we're going to ask the, the band to play and sing as you reflect. As you take communion, you take in Christ, the blood of Christ and the, and the, and the body of Christ, and you return to your seats through the middle aisle. Would you stand with me? I want to give you a private moment now. Would you just close your eyes and bow your heads? In a room full of people right here, I want you just to imagine the Lord. And you've worked hard and you've tried every possible way. But there's something way bigger than you in your life. I want you to hear God telling you this morning, telling you this morning that he is big enough to heal your marriage and he's big enough to bring the prodigal son and daughter home he's big enough to provide in your finances and he's big enough to give you the answer you've been seeking he's bigger than your disease he's bigger than your test results he's bigger than your diagnosis he's bigger than your label he's bigger than your sin he's bigger than your secret dreams you've held on to for your future been too afraid to share it with anyone else. His love is greater. And he's inviting you in 
Would you give him the little bit that you have, the bread and the juice that you have? Would you give it to him? Put it in his hand. Trust him to multiply it. So, Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning in this sacrament of communion. I just ask, God, as we as a church step out from our seats, our comfort zones, and we walk to the back or to the front, we step up to this place just of bread and juice. It seems so insignificant, but in your hands, God, you change our life and you change the world because you can see how this small movement will change the world. And God, as we write our prayers in these circles and we hang them up on the whiteboard, would you honor these bold prayers? As you hear us say, we are not leaving from this circle till you move, until you act on our behalf. God, thank you for being a God that gives us permission to ask for whatever we wish in your name and you'll do it. To pray bold prayers and to know that you hear every word of them. Bless us. Give us your grace. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen.